Today on Mother's Day, we are completing a series uh, called The People of Purpose, uh, People with a Purpose, that we began in the new year. And what we have been doing together is going through the book of Genesis. And we've been going through the book of Genesis with a perspective. And that perspective is to find out what God's purpose is for people and how people are to respond to God's purpose for their lives on earth. God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for the church. And when we are walking in God's purposes, then we will be bearing fruit and finding fulfillment in him. And we've looked at people that have have, have, uh, fulfilled God's purposes in Genesis, those that have gone against it. And now we come to the last character that we were looking at in Genesis today, and that's going to be Jacob. Next Sunday, I will be preaching here, beginning our new series. And our new series next Sunday is called Mind Matters. Mind Matters. And we'll be looking at what the Bible talks about and speaks and teaches about the Christian mind, the renewal of our mind, the mind of Christ, the mind of the Spirit. And we'll be looking at corrupted minds, the corrupted minds of the world, and a fleshly mindset, how Christians have to be careful not to think like the world and act like the world, which is inappropriate for them now that they are in Christ, and how to think like God thinks. That's what we're really going to be looking at. How to think like God thinks. Mind matters starting next Sunday. But we're looking at Jacob and God's purposes for Jacob. And as you can see uh, in the title of my sermon today, I've put Jacob, the end does not justify the means. The end does, just, does not justify the means. And, um, and that is really a changing of a quote from a person I'll mention later that says the end does justify the means. And what I mean by this, the end does not justify the means, is that God had a plan for Jacob. He gave Jacob prophecy and promises. And uh, Jacob tried to uh, bring those promises to pass by fleshly means, by means that God was not in approval of. And we're going to see with Jacob that it is possible for Christians to pursue godly goals in a fleshly manner. So, I want to start with the first scripture, which brings us nearly to the end of Jacob's life. And here we find that Jacob is meeting with Pharaoh. He's been through all the things that he's been through, and we'll look at those in a moment. And he thought that he had lost his favorite son. He mourned for years and years, having been told by by his other sons that Joseph had had died, when in fact he'd been sold into slavery, went to prison, uh, then became the ruler under Pharaoh of Egypt and organized the nation to prepare for famine. And finally, Jacob is reunited with his son Joseph, and he meets Pharaoh. And when he meets Pharaoh, we see a a beautiful glimpse into uh, how he has viewed his life to that point. And he says this to Pharaoh in Genesis 47, verse 9. Jacob's summary of his life, he says, Jacob answered Pharaoh, I have traveled on this earth for 130 years. The years of my life have been few and full of sorrow and less than the years that my father lived. When Jacob at the end of his life met Pharaoh, the great king of Egypt, he felt that he needed to apologize for his haggard appearance and his weariness. He reflected that compared to uh, his other ancestors, that his life had been relatively short, perhaps a hint of jealousy or sorrow um, that um, he wasn't living and full of vigor as perhaps um, uh, Isaac and especially Abraham who, who died full of vigor 
with 2020 vision and everything um, in, in strength. And other Bible translations of Genesis 47, verse 9, use the words about when he says, my life has been full of for- sorrow. It uses words such as, um, I've just lost my, my place. Yeah, uses words like unpleasant, my life has been unpleasant, or my life has been difficult, or my life has been full of evil, or my life has been hard. And so Joseph is looking at the quality of his life at the end of his life, and he's saying, I'm exhausted, I'm haggard, I'm tired, I'm beat up, it's been so difficult, it's been unpleasant, it's been full of sorrow, and it's been hard. Why was Jacob such a wreck of a man at the end of his life? Why did he describe to this great Pharaoh his life in a sort of pitiful, sorrowful way? Why had he come to this place? Surely he'd been following God's plans for his life. And wouldn't it have been nice if he could have met Pharaoh and say, I've been through many hardships, trials, and and valley experiences in my life, but God has brought me through them all, and I, I'm full of praise and, and thanksgiving for my life and my journey with the Lord. But he, he didn't speak in those terms of joy. He spoke in terms of exhaustion, tiredness, and sorrow. Why? Well, I think when we look at the story of, jo- of Jacob, we see that The reason was, was the way that he went about living his life. He pursued the promises of God by means of the flesh. His strategies to attain what God had promised him were carnal strategies, worldly strategies, and strategies that caused him and others more harm than good. He didn't take the um, example of his father Abraham, of his grandfather Abraham, or his father Isaac. Remember that Abraham is a model to all of us believers of the life of faith. Romans 4 says that we walk in the footsteps of our father Abraham, his footsteps of faith. So when you look at Abraham's life, you look at how to live by faith in God's promises. And Abraham made many mistakes but he learned and grew to become a man of complete, mature faith and trust in God for his life. That's his story. And then Isaac, Isaac, he is a picture of the believer's identity. Who you are. Who are you? Well, Galatians 4 says that you believers, you are like Isaac. So you are to be like Isaac and live like Isaac. And when you study Isaac, and we looked at Isaac last week, you see that Isaac was a man that believed God's promises, but achieved God's promises God's way. He only had one wife. And when his wife couldn't bear children, what did Isaac do? Get another wife? Get his own Hagar? No, he prayed, and then God brought him a child. Not only that, but when there was famine in the land, he didn't run away from the land like his grandfather Abraham did, getting into trouble in Egypt in doing so, but he stayed in the land of famine according to the word of the Lord, and despite the circumstances, he sowed and reaped a hundredfold and grew rich in the circumstances of famine by faith in God's promise. And when he was so rich and powerful, and King Abimelech said, you're too powerful for us, go away, he didn't say, no, I am powerful, you go away, but he left a man of peace. And then when a few shepherd boys argued over a well that his own grandfather had uh, dug and that he had re-dug Isaac, instead of fighting and squashing these flies, these other shepherds, he gave them the well. And then when it happened all over again, the second well he gave them the well. And when the finally he was, there was no longer strife over the third well he found, he called it Rehoboth. He said, the Lord has made room for me. He didn't make room for himself. And rather than fighting and struggling to, a, to achieve the resources that he needed, 
He trusted God. And when he trusted God and did it God's way, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in an Old Testament form through Isaac, God blessed him beyond measure and he was justified by works. I say all this because now we come to Jacob. And I believe that Jacob is a picture of the immature Christian who is pursuing God's promises, but pursuing God's promises in a fleshly, worldly manner. Is that possible? I think Jacob shows us that it is. Jacob did not take his struggles to the Lord like Isaac, who would meditate in the, uh, the fields. Jacob was impatient. Jacob did not go to the Lord to solve his problems. He thought he knew how to solve the problems himself. Uh, his impatience with God, his impatience with how fast things were, were taking place in his life and how slow God's promises were being manifest causes him to stand up and to take things into his own hands and to put strategies in for achievement that were ungodly and caused more harm than good. Scripture shows us, as we're going to see, that God was always for Jacob, but not always with him, especially concerning the strategies he employed to pursue God's promised blessings. This is why I'm calling this sermon, The End Does Not Justify the Means. Now, this is a, a change of a quote from a man called Machiavelli, Machiavelli, who uh, died in 1527. Machiavelli was an Italian diplomat, an author, and a philosopher. And many believe that he is the father of modern politics. Have you ever watched politics? Of course you have. It's in your face all the time. And have you ever seen how politicians, not all of them, but some of them, operate in order to, to, to get power and to achieve their will? Have you seen how they can stab one, other, one another in the back? How they, they form alliances and then uh, uh, betray those alliances all the time trying to appear like butter wouldn't melt in their life, trying to mouth, trying to appear so good, but using all these political tech techniques, uh, betrayals and manipulations in order to get to where they want to go. And Machiavelli, he was a man who encouraged this because he said, look, the end justifies the means. In other words, it doesn't matter what you do to other people as long as you get the result done. If you get the results that you're looking for, however you go about getting those results, as long as you get a few, those results, then it doesn't matter how you got them. I knew a, a person that used to say he was a um, a, a, a Christian leader, and he used to say this, Bruce, you've got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. And what he meant by that is you've got to smash and, and break a few people and uh, treat a few people and, and drive through a few people and sort a few people out and, and, and deal with a few people in order to get the result that you want. Break a few eggs to get an omelet. Well, I think that Jacob was a little bit like that. You've got to break a few eggs to make an, an, an omelet. But the end justifies the means. I've seen in the ministry over the years, I was part of a, a very large church for many, many years, and one of the blessings of being part of, of one of Britain's largest churches for many, many years is that I got to meet a lot of um, very prominent preachers from all the way around the world. And I met some of the most marvelous men and women of God who were exactly what they were off the platform as they were on the platform, full of integrity, peace, and the fruit of the Spirit. Springs to mind, Reinhard Bonnke. Had spent some time with him over the years. And, and he was exactly what you got on the platform. But also, I met some horrible people who could preach wonderful sermons, but off the platform, the way that they treated their staff, the way that they spoke, they, they, they were driven 
driven. There were more politicians than, than ministers. And yet on the platform, they, they, their sermons were powerful. They blessed people. They moved in spiritual gifts. But isn't it true that when we read 1, Corin when we read 1 Corinthians, Paul says you lack no spiritual gift, but what you do lack is love. And so Jacob was somebody whose God's anointing was on his life for sure. God had given promises to Jacob. He'd said over, over him before he was even born that the elder would serve the younger. God had said it. God had a promise, and Jacob knew it. But isn't it funny, in our next scripture, Genesis 25, 26, you can see the nature of Jacob even as he's being born. Genesis 25, 26. Um, after this, his brother came out, that's Jacob, with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. So he is two twins. And, uh, and who's going to come out first? Because the one that came out first would get the birthright and the blessing. They would get the inheritance. And so even these little babies, uh, not having done right or wrong and not, not having learned how to speak, Esau comes out, but there's Jacob hanging on, trying to pull him back in. And therefore they called him Jacob, which means twister or grasper. Now, the way I'm looking at Jacob today, I hope you don't feel I'm too uh, harsh on Jacob. Uh, after all, uh, I, ha I have called my own son Jacob, Jake. And that was a word of the Lord. So, but, but we're looking at the angle here of achieving God's promises in ungodly ways. And so there he was, uh, grasping even when he came out of the womb. The, the elder shall serve the younger. Jacob, meaning struggler. Isaac, his father, meaning laughter. Isaac ended his, ended his days in joy. Jacob ended his days still struggling with life, grabbing and grasping at the promises of God. But this is not how faith works. Faith works by patience, trust, prayer, and going God's way, even if it appears that going God's way will actually prevent God's promises from coming. Abraham's moment of greatest maturity of faith, when God said, take the son, take the son I promised you, you had to wait 25 years for, take the promised son, the son that I promised you, out of him, you will eventually have multitudes of descendants. Take that son, your only promised son, and take him and sacrifice him to me. Now, Abraham... Hebrews tells us that Abraham reckoned with the reckoning of faith and said to himself, if I sacrifice Isaac, God will have to raise him from the dead because God has promised me that Isaac will be my seed. So he had faith even beyond death and he trusted God implicitly, even though, um, humanly speaking, to sacrifice your own son would be to end what God had promised you. And so we see that Abraham did that. And when Abraham did that, God said, you're mature. You're justified by works. You have proven to me that you have reached full maturity in walking with me. He went God's way that seemed at the time to have prevented God's promises. And you'll find that in your life, sometimes going God's way may look like you're going to lose out. But in fact... Going God's way, because it's God's way, you will never lose out. Sooner or later, you will see God's blessing. You see, um, the end does not justify the means. In fact, the means to God's end is everything. The means to God's end is everything. Because the end is in God's hands. So you don't have to act like the world to achieve what God wants you to achieve. The means are everything. 
because the end is in God's hands. So you go God's way, even when the carnal mind or the world would think that you're mad, you decide to go God's way, even when it looks, if you go God's way, you're going to lose your Isaac. Your promise, your destiny, your calling. You go God's way because in the end, your destiny, your calling is in God's hands. It's the ultimate trust to be able to walk in God's way even when it looks at the time that if you walk God's way, the plans are going to fail. I'm not going to go into details, but I spent, there was a time in my life where this happened to me. Now, I've been, I'm a Jake, I've been a Jacob in my time, and I even struggle being a Jacob now, so this is, this is no, no glory to me. On the contrary, but there was a time when I was in a situation where the promises of God seemed to be, it's, uh, seemed to be in the balance, and it looked like these promises of God were, could be taken away, and the destiny that seemed so sure, seemed so obvious, seemed so confirmed, uh, it seemed so, so you know, the, the, the highway was straight. It looked like it was going to be taken from me. And I was advised, and it looked like that the only way to stay on track was to uh, break some eggs, cause a fuss, move into political maneuvering, um, take a stand, assert myself, and fight in order to keep it. Now, at that time, I had a clear word from the Lord that I was to act like Isaac. So don't take any credit for this. It was God's blessing. And so instead, I did the absolute opposite, and I threw myself on the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, humility, self-control, faith and faithfulness, faith in God and faithfulness to others. I threw myself on that, and in the end... It appeared that going God's way, I had lost what God had promised. That going God's way, I had lost what God had promised. And that if I'd fought, I might have kept what God had promised. But a few months later, I found that what I'd lost was worth losing. And that what God had put in front of me by losing it was more special and more valuable than that which, if I'd fought for and kept, would have wearied me, tired me, and caused me to go down a track in my ministry where if I fought to keep it, if I fought to get it, I would fight to keep it forevermore, and I would become like a Jacob instead of growing to become like an Isaac. So remember, uh, God God had said to uh, Jacob, the old, the old will serve the younger. This is my will for you. You will rise. You will inherit. This is my will. It's my promise to you. So how did Jacob go around inheriting this promise from God? Well, Genesis, 20, uh, Genesis 25, we see this picture. You might know the story. The first thing he did was, was, was try and get the birthright from his brother Esau. And what did he do? Esau was out. Esau was carnal. Esau Esau loved food. Esau was a real physical man, dominated by physicality. And so Jacob produced a beautiful stew, a beautiful stew, lovely stew, and waited for his brother to come back after a long time hunting. And when his brother came in, so body dominated, he was so hungry. I mean, he could have eaten anything. He could have gone through, you know, uh, 10 Big Macs, large fries, and those Sundays afterwards, no problem. And so he came back and he was hungry. And there is Jacob wafting the smell of the stew. Oh, give me some of that stew. Well, well here we are, Genesis 25, 29. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that stew. I'm famished. That's why he was called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die. He wasn't. Esau said, what good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and got up and left. And Hebrews warns us as Christians not to be like 
um, Esau and sell our inheritance for some worldly prize, okay? But I'm talking about Jacob today. And um, Jacob was very conniving there. He knew what he was doing. He was very Machiavellian. The end justifies the means. My brother's starving, feels like he's, he's dying. I know what his weakness is like. I know Esau, he's a body man, you know, he loves his food. So I've, I've identified his weakness and I'm going to play his weakness into my hands. I'm going to be a politician. I'm going to be Machiavelli. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, make sure that the, the end will justify the means of me taking advantage of his weakness. So as bad that Esau was, so Jacob did this. This wasn't God's plan not to feed your brother in order to, to put him in such a place to prey upon somebody else's weakness in order to get your result? Is that the way of the Holy Spirit? Is that the fruit of the Spirit? Would Isaac have done that? But Jacob was impatient. Often impatience is the greatest opposition to your growth and your achievement, achieving the things of God that God wants you to achieve. Patience. Patience, endurance, continuing to believe, continuing to trust, even when it doesn't look like it's happening. Abraham made mistakes in this area. 25 years waiting for his Isaac, he had his Ishmael, all right? Patience, but he was impatient, so he deceived his brother. How do you think Esau felt after he'd eaten his lentil stew? Do you think he was grateful to his brother Jacob? Or do you think something inside him realized that he'd been taken advantage of and now he was full, he had lost his birthright? Do you think he felt love and honor towards his brother or was something in there simmering that would cause problems in the future? And then we have the, the, next, the next time Jacob tried to pursue the promises of God through fleshly means. Genesis 27, verse 32. Isaac, Isaac now is so old that he's frail, very, very frail. Can't see properly, losing um, his, his sensory perception. And so Jacob and his mother Rachel plot a plan to deceive Rachel's husband and Jacob's father to prey on his vulnerability and old age. You know the story. Uh, Jacob dresses up in, um, in hair, a goat's hair, makes sure he smells like his earthy brother and, um, uh, and, and disguises himself, goes to, his brother, uh, goes to his father Isaac, asks for the blessing. He's already got the birthright. And Isaac checks and asks him blank, is that you, Esau, my son? And Jacob said, lies to his father and says, yes, it is. Genesis 27. His father Isaac asked him, Jacob, who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I, I just, so I've gone, I've gone ahead of myself. So Isaac goes and he says, who are you? And Isaac says, I am Esau. And then he touches him, he feels him, he's deceived. And so Isaac then blesses Jacob as if he was Esau, blesses him. And then after that, Esau comes through the door. And this is where we read, it's Esau here in Genesis 27. Esau comes in. Now Esau, not knowing any better, is ready for the blessing. The firstborn blessing, very important, um, lucrative, and uh, 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 prosperous blessing. It meant many, many things. So his father asks Esau, who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Isaac, this old man, begins to tremble violently. I never really saw that until once it hit me between the eyes. Imagine the scene. Isaac is trembling violently. This old man, barely see, senses dimming. 
is shaking because he can't cope with what's just happened to him psychologically or even physically. Uh, Isaac trembled violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him. And indeed, he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's word, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry. And if you look in the Hebrew, I mean, this cry is a scream from the depth of his being that this man has done it to me again. Bless me too, my father. There was no blessing. Because once given, even though it was got by deceit, it was given. <laughs> the elder will serve the younger. God's promise. But is this the means that God wanted the elder to serve the younger? For Isaac's wife to, be, to betray him and plot against him? For uh, Jacob to um, uh, pretend that he was uh, Esau, thinking to himself, the end, getting what was promised me, justifies the means. Well, you know, is it possible to pursue God's promises with selfish motivation? Yes. Let me say that again. Let it sink in. Is it possible to pursue God's promises through selfish motivation? Yes, it is. And carnal strategies? Yes. We've seen this. These were genuine promises, from genuine God, this was God's plan for Jacob's life. But the end does not justify the means. The means are everything because in the end, the end is in the hands of God. And that's a great mature faith to believe. Because often what people do is they want the end... Going God's way doesn't look like it will bring that end. Or going God's way is, has gone on, gone on too long and I'm fed up of waiting. And so they turn from saying the means will justify the ends. And we take it out of the hands of God, out of trust, prayer. And instead of praying it through, we take it into our own arms. We act like the politicians of this world, um, the people of this world. And we strategize, politicize, manipulate uh, cover ourselves with a mask of who we are, appear to be something we're not, double dealing behind the scenes, pretending to be one, flattering people in order to get there, and we're doing all this thing, praise the Lord, to get the, the result that God has promised to us because we have become Machiavellian Christians who in our life is said, the end, uh, the means justifies the end. And I'm telling you today, that the means is everything and that the means will bring God's end because if you fight carnally to get the promises of God, even if you get the promises of God, you won't have learned to trust God and then you will think in your mind, I fought carnally to get the promises of God, therefore I must fight carnally to keep the promises of God and this is why there's so many church splits in the world and this is why there's so many people with, with strong anointings and great promises that fall from grace or that have stinking characters because they see that there's anointing, true anointing, real promises. They've achieved some of these, but they've achieved it in the wrong manner, but they think this, is, must, this must be the way it works. It is not the way it works. It is not the way it works. And the way it works means everything to God. The way you act means everything to God. Your transparency means everything to God. Your preparation for Isaac to be laid down because you know that to hold on to Isaac, you'd be going against the ways of God. It means everything. Because if you lay down your Isaac to go God's way, that Isaac will never die. It'll come back maybe in a different form, but the different form will be better, more joyful, more greater than if you, if you hold on to your Isaac and take it away from God, and then you find what you've got, you've got by force when you should have got by grace. Don't take, Jacob took by force what was promised 
be received by grace, took by force. And I don't think I need to go much more into the story except to highlight some, um, some points. Um, Esau was furious, plotted to, um, to destroy Jacob. The means that Jacob took in order to gain what God had promised, he forced the promises of God through fleshly means instead of through faith and trust and love. And so what happened to Jacob? Well, what you sow, you reap in this life. What you sow, you reap. And he had sowed the flesh to reap the promises, but instead he had to leave. He had to go to a faraway land. And guess what? You do, so, you do reap what you sow. And what did he reap? Jacob reaped Laban. Laban was more of a Machiavellian than Jacob. And it, Laban had been in this game, because it is a game, He'd been in the political game of manipulation, fleshly means. Laban had been in this game for a lot longer than Jacob. When Jacob got there, he thought he was getting his Rachel, and he woke up with his Leah. And then he was told to work another seven years to get his Rachel. And then uh, after that, when, he, uh, when God blessed him with the uh, spotted um, sheep or goat, um, he got worried because he was worried that Laban was going to to steal those things because he'd met his match in the world. If, you're a, if you want to go out and fight like the world fights, if you want to argue like the world fights, if you want to stand on your um, rights, you want to stand on your rights like the world does, you want to justify yourself, you want to assert yourself like the world, let me tell you, I promise you, someone will come around twice as strong as you in your life and do the same back to you. And God is not just ju judging you, but God is trying to say, you see, it doesn't work. He had to flee from Laban. Laban ran after them with all of his soldiers and said, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What a mess. And then when he went back, he was so worried about, um, so worried that, um, uh, that, that his brother still wanted to kill him, what did he do? Sent loads of presents. Tried to placate him with presents and money and material possessions. And then he thought that might be enough. So he sent all his family ahead of him while he stayed. So in other words, if he didn't like the presents, he could take the family. And if he killed the family or imprisoned the family, who would be left? Jacob. Yeah. Self-centered, selfish, even then. And then he had that incredible wrestling with God, didn't he? And I, I like a lot of preachers preach about wrestling with God for the blessing. And I, I think that's a really good picture of intercession, wrestling with God and not letting go of God till you get the breakthrough. I think God likes that. You can learn a lot and grow a lot as a Christian through wrestling intercession and never giving up. And then when God blesses you, the blessing is so much sweeter because you prayed so strong and so long to get it. So I like that version. But would Isaac have ever wrestled with God? He didn't wrestle with Abraham when he was put on the uh, altar. I, I think that if, if God came down and started wrestling Isaac, I think Isaac would go, I submit. I'm not going to fight you, God. I submit. And maybe God would have given him the blessing anyway. But Jacob was, you see that, that fighter in him. That, I'll fight God. So there's a good way of looking at it. And I like the idea of intercession. But think about it from another way. He's fighting with God. For goodness sake, why are you fighting with God? If you fight with human beings, you are fighting with God. Let me say that again. If you are a contentious person, if you are a person that annoys people in the workplace, okay, and it's your fault, not theirs, then you're also fighting with God. Now, uh, uh, he, he, what did God have to do? He had to <clears throat> disable him. Sometimes God has to disable us because we won't stop fighting. Sometimes God, and maybe some of you can talk about it in your life, sometimes God puts you in a place where you're broken, where the things that happen to you just break you, and God allows it. And you, you, forever you've got a scar or a wound. Something's happened to you. Or you walk 
with a limp. And God had to do it because you would not soften yourself. You would not humble yourself. So God struck you in the way that you walked through life. And it was horrible and it was painful. But the moment of striking, you walked with a limp. And that limp, you know, will always stay with you. But that limp was a blessing because that limp reminds you that now you need to trust in God. You need his walking stick in order to get farther. And without that, you may never have turned um, um, to, to, to him. Jace, Joseph, he had his part. Jacob had his part with Joseph, didn't he? If, Joseph, if Jacob had not made him his favorite, brought him that technical, technicolor coat of dreams, uh, wouldn't it have made it a little bit easier? Joseph was already filled with his self-importance, and Joseph had already heard the promise of God over his life that he would rule. He would rule. But because of Jacob's favoritism, it, uh, God, God, God turned it for good, but because of Jacob's favoritism, it had an element of him being taken away and sold into slavery. We'll go into Joseph. We've done him before, but Joseph pursued the promise of God by faith. Remember that. He refused to take Potiphar as his mistress. He refused, and he worked wherever he was, as a slave, in a prison, and refused not to go God's way and, and got there in the end. So we return as we finish to the scripture we began with, Genesis 47, verse 9. Jacob answered Pharaoh, I have traveled on this earth for 130 years. The years of my life have been few, and full of sorrow, unpleasantness, difficulty, evil, and hardship. He was wrecked. He was wrecked. Because the work of the flesh is hard work. It's exhausting. When you go the flesh way, the work of the flesh is exhausting. It's tiring. Machiavellian, end justifies the means, will not only destroy those around you, but it will destroy you. You will not be renewed that way. But walking in the Spirit by the fruit of the Spirit, these things, being prepared to lay down your Isaac, rather, rather, rather lose and go God's way than get what you think is God's way by going against God's way. Let's learn this powerful lesson for our lives because it will release a move of the Holy Spirit through us We'll come to a place where we, we don't have to pretend that God has done it, but we know that we have made it happen. But we will know that we haven't made it happen at all, but God has made it happen. And trusting him, believing him, and walking his way has meant that he himself has done these things. God had said to Jacob, I will do these things for you. Jacob should have followed the Lord, and the byproduct would be, that God would have done them. He did achieve what God had promised him, but in the wrong manner, and in the end, where did it leave him? Father, we thank you for the, uh, the picture of these great patriarchs, and I apologize if I've been a little bit hard on Jacob today. I was just coming from a particular angle that is, is true, and there's probably more to the man that I've said. But Lord, we, 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 want, we want to go your way. I want to do it your way and leave the end in your hands. Thank you for all the promises of the house. Thank you for the destinies and the callings on our life and our careers and the things that you've said that we will become and we will do. And Lord, help us, Lord, to be Isaacs rather than Jacobs. Help us never to say the end justifies the means, but the means will secure the ends, even at times when it feels like going your way uh, will ruin we know that going your way will bring a better result. And we'll be fitter, stronger, happier, because at the end of our lives, we don't want to be like Jacob. We want to be rejoicing. And though we've come through many trials and tribulations and valleys, we can still have a skip in our feet. We can still have, say to ourselves, but God has been so good, and I have grown so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.